thank you, Mark, for that very generous introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, staff and the faculty who've done so much work in uh, promoting the event tonight and to uh, all of you for attending. Uh, usually when you know that you're going to be doing a lecture in a, in a room um, of this size, you gather together uh, all your family and uh, friends to, uh, to fill it out a little bit. Uh, and this is quite strange because I know most of the people in the room, it's a slightly disquieting experience to, uh, uh, to have to give the lecture. But I can't fill it out with uh, my family uh, and friends because uh, many of them are 11,000 miles away uh, in Belfast. And uh, Belfast is going to loom rather large in, in what I say tonight, as you can probably see from the, from the photograph here. Uh, I love this photograph. It's from, uh, it's from 1973. Uh, and it depicts, in my mind, the way that um, life in Northern Ireland through the Troubles um, went on as usual for many, many people. Um, and I mean, what, what I love about this photograph in particular is that uh, up until uh, the British Army arrived in Northern Ireland, um, it's highly unlikely this woman had ever seen a black person, let alone one in uniform uh, with a semi-automatic uh, rifle in her front garden while she, tried to, uh, while she tried to mow it. So it encapsulates beautifully for me, I think, the uh, complexity uh, of the Northern Ireland conflict, and I think many of the conflicts uh, which we uh, have to deal with in contemporary complex societies. So what I want to say tonight is um, it's going to refer to Northern Ireland uh, quite a lot, um, but I want to make clear that uh, I think that what I'm saying doesn't just apply to uh, divided societies or, or deeply divided societies. Uh, I think those societies give um, overt manifestation to a range of political problems uh, that exist in all societies. Uh, and what I want to suggest is that we have a tendency uh, in politics, remarkably enough, to gloss over uh, conflicts uh, and problems uh, to normalize uh, prevailing behaviors and ways of doing things. I think the established institutional architecture within which we do this uh, often emerges from conflicts and bears the hallmark of conflicts, um, as do the various pol policy paradigms which emerge uh, from those established institutions. So that's the kind of backdrop uh, to what I want to say. But before I get into that in any great depth, and I promise not to go on about political theory, uh, too much tonight. I'm cognizant it's a, it's a public lecture and um, I should try and say something which should be vaguely interesting. So I will try to do that. But before going on to uh, the more theoretical parts of the argument, I want to just to talk a little bit about uh, a school. Um, uh, the school is uh, Hazelwood Integrated Primary School in North Belfast. And as many of you will be aware, um, education in Northern Ireland, especially at the primary level, but also at secondary school as well, is deeply segregated, uh, with state schools uh, uh, primarily being the uh, province of uh, Protestant children and Catholic kids mainly going to Catholic schools. So there has been this movement um, to develop more integrated uh, schools. Um, there, there aren't very many of them. Uh, and indeed, Hazelwood is the only one uh, that exists in North Belfast. So uh, running integrated education in Northern Ireland is a, a difficult task uh, at the best of things. So let me, let me just briefly quote to you from the school's mission, as, as I find it on their website. It says, we are an integrated co-educational school. At Hazelwood, we value all our pupils as individuals and respect their right to be different and to excel in different ways. Our pupils are treated fairly, regardless of sex, color, or creed. We expect our pupils to work hard to keep the school's fair rules and our parents to support us in these aims. The school endeavors to help each child realize their potential within a positive and caring learning environment. Fairly standard stuff, uh, of course, but you know, there are some uh, noble aims within that. And then, 
uh, the school sets out nine broad educational aims, and uh, I've uh, got three of them uh, on the slide. Firstly, to achieve understanding through the encouragement of mutual respect. Secondly, to enhance the pupil's self-esteem and therefore his or her ability to cope with and accept other people. Uh, and thirdly, to develop an understanding of the world the child will be living in. Now, this all looks pretty normal uh, and fairly standard stuff in schools uh, in, uh, in the UK, in Ireland and elsewhere. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about uh, Hazelwood Integrated School. Um, in 2007, this is 10 years after the Good Friday Agreement supposedly brought peace and an end to the Northern Ireland conflict. 2007, uh, the Northern Ireland office decided to build a 25 foot high fence through the middle of the playground. Uh, and they did this because uh, the school was in an interface area and um, uh, one side was chucking petrol bombs at the other side. A, um, on other occasions, uh, people were actually climbing up the school to get to the roof so they could rip the tiles off and you know, throw them at the people who lived on the other side of the interface. Um, which is remarkable. This is undoubtedly my favorite peace line in Northern Ireland. There's about 100 of them, but this is my favorite one. Now, having, a, having a favorite peace line is a bit like having you know, a favorite undertaker or a favorite proctologist or something like that. But I'm mildly fascinated by, by such matters. And I think this example encapsulates the uh, complexity of the Northern Ireland conflict and the way in which um, it continues, despite what we do politically, despite the uh, agreements we reach, the institutions we form, uh, the conflict uh, is resilient. And it has to be said, the fence is certainly preparing uh, the children of North Belfast for the world they will be living in. Uh, indeed, this is uh, the biggest of the um, uh, peace lines uh, in, in West Belfast. Um, and I should just say the peace lines in Northern Ireland uh, were meant to be temporary uh, when they were uh, first built. Um, many of them have now been standing for longer than the Berlin Wall uh, was standing. Uh, and the Institute for Conflict Research uh, estimates that there are now about 100. What's important to realize is that uh, the number of peace lines in Northern Ireland has been growing since the Good Friday Agreement supposedly brought peace and an end to conflict. So more and more of these things are being erected and they're getting bigger. And indeed some of the ones that have been built in, in the past, I'm not sure if you can uh, quite see with, with uh, this slide, but it started out as a brick wall and then they you know, built it a bit higher. Uh, and then further along uh, towards the, the end there, they've actually had to erect another fence on top of the two layers they'd already built. Um, <clears throat> so it's a fairly blatant point that, uh, that I want to make, but the idea that, that politics is, is a means by which uh, we resolve uh, deeply ingrained um, social conflicts is, I think, uh, deeply problematic and it limits the horizons, in my mind, uh, of, of what I think politics can achieve. Now, before I get into this in a little bit more depth, I, I do want to digress uh, a little bit. Um, when I was trying to think of what to, um, what to cover in this lecture, which has been a, a long time in the coming, um, I, I was thinking about the, the various themes of my research around conflict and democracy in Northern Ireland. Uh, and simultaneously, uh, during the winter, I was, um, I was reading a novel. Um, and that novel was uh, Julian Barnes's uh, The Sense of an Ending, which um, subsequently won uh, the Booker Prize. It's a bit like, you know, I was reading it in the winter. It's a bit like, you know, your favorite band who you've seen in front of 20 other people. And then they become popular and, you know, they fill stadiums and thousands of people go and see them and you don't like them anymore. So that's how, how I felt when this won the Booker, because I, I think it's a, a really interesting uh, novel. And in the sense of an ending, um, the protagonist is a guy called uh, Tony Webster. And Tony Webster is heading towards old age and reflecting uh, on his life. 
Um, in the first part of the book, he builds a narrative uh, about his formative years at school and university and the impact that uh, those years had on his life that followed. As things unfold, he revisits the death of uh, his brilliant eccentric friend, who was called Adrian. Uh, and um, Adrian had later had a relationship with Tony's girlfriend at, at university. And uh, the, the book is, is uh, Tony's attempt to um, go back through his life and make sense of uh, now, what becomes uh, clear for Tony is that uh, his story was a series of uh, partial memories and partial forgettings. What becomes clear for Tony is that his story uh, is a series of partial memories and partial forgettings, rewritings of events, uh, fabrications, and the construction of meanings. These combined together to enable him to uh, make sense of what he had encountered and what he had done. Disparate details and events were brought together in a single narrative to provide a unified story that pushed contradictions and complexities to one side, lest they interrupt the flow of the narrative. And indeed, as, uh, as Tony tells uh, the reader in the book, Indeed, on the, on the first page, he says uh, that what you end up remembering isn't always the same as what you have witnessed. Now, I think this phom phenomenon underpins the way in which uh, we understand conflict in contemporary politics. And indeed, following um, the work of Michel Foucault, I want to suggest that conflict is constructed uh, as a problem in itself. Uh, and problematizations establish a particular paradigm within which potential solutions are imagined. So I want to suggest that understanding conflict as an inherent problem uh, is a political technique designed to normalize conditions of peace and democracy. Conflict becomes something to be resolved rather than something that we actually need to properly understand. We lose sight of the fact that conflict can be highly productive. Uh, we lose sight that, as in uh, the work of people like Daniel Ross make clear, that um, many, if not most, of uh, democracies in the world emerged through conflict. It took conflict to actually uh, formulate them into what they are. So I think what we're witnessing is a process that kind of makes us avert our eyes from the continuation of conflict in contemporary society. In many ways, I think we rewrite our stories, imagining that where conflict may have been a part of what makes us what we are now, it is something that we have overcome and something that we can package away as a uh, historical phenomenon. And where conflict emerges again, such as uh, the, the riots in, in the UK, um, in, in the British summertime, just gone. Um, it's depicted as pathological. It's depicted as uh, something which is, uh, you know, perpetrated by mindless idiots who only deserve to be punished, rather than being considered a, as evidence of deep-rooted unrest and conflict that just isn't always uh, manifestly expressed. Now, what I want to suggest is that conflict is actually an ontological condition of the complex societies in which we must act politically. And I want to emphasize that we do need to act upon all of the um, conflicts that we uh, come up against, but we do so in highly imperfect conditions where we have limited knowledge of the outcomes of our actions. But also, I think, uh, politics tends to oversimplify the ineradicable uh, nature of conflict. And that's partly, I, I believe, because um, most of our systems aren't actually very good at dealing with complexity. But in effect, I think we simplify so that we can act politically. Uh, but in so doing, we can uh, misread and misrepresent political issues, their origins, and their continuity and reproduction. In the sense of an ending, Tony's friend, Adrian, uh, quotes 
a fictitious French historian called Lagrange. Uh, and Lagrange states that uh, history is that certainty produced at the point where the imperfections of memory meet the inadequacies of documentation. And I think what we uh, do too often in politics is spend uh, too much of our time trying to achieve a form of certainty uh, based on forgetting our conflicts rather than uh, bearing them closely in mind. So let me go on to some of the uh, theoretical meat of this and, and, and then I'm going to talk about Northern Ireland a little. <clears throat> so the approach that I use in the paper is uh, what I'm, I'm calling the signature, uh, although that's a theoretical term uh, borrowed from uh, the recent work of uh, Giorgio Agamben. Now, according this, to this theory of the signature, um, we need to spend more time understanding the importance of certain terms uh, and concepts in the social sciences in the construction of the epistemological orders within which we understand and try and deal with conflicts. And what Agamben's pointing to is, is some of the differences between the way in which we uh, use political concepts and terminology, the way we talk about conceptual issues, and then how we go about uh, implementing uh, them in practice. And what we get in that process is a glossing over of, um, of the differentiation uh, in the ways in which concepts are understood and used by different people. So we talk about grand concepts but like democracy or community or several other things I've probably written about and, and, and don't uh, necessarily, in, in the way in which we iterate those concepts, we're, we're actually incapable of, of encapsulating the many different ways in which they're interpreted. So instead, what we do is we use a signature, and that is we use terms as a way of giving a particular imprint which confers authority on socio-political processes that, uh, to use the work of Michael Frieden, are in fact inconclusive, ambiguous, uh, and indeterminate. The signature is a source of creating legitimacy where the finer details of the implementation of a particular concept are less than clear. And I think peace and democracy uh, are two such conceptual terms that often perform this somewhat elliptical role. Too often they're rhetorical devices to impel processes of supposed consensus and cohesion or narratives of reconciliation. When in fact, I think conflict and violence remain at least partially determining uh, factors uh, in most societies. Even if violence is only symbolically present at a given point in time, it's still a contributor and something which frames uh, social relations. In political terms, the key issue here is the point at which uh, the established uh, paradigm is translated into what Foucault would call it a discursive regime. That is that we take a snapshot of epistemological reality uh, and that takes on the status of a regime through which uh, phenomena, phenomena need to be uh, addressed. So a in the Northern Ireland example, there's a particular depiction of what the conflict is and if you want to articulate the conflict as actually being more sophisticated or about something slightly different, it becomes really difficult. And it's also very hard to, therefore, translate that into uh, a different mode of political action. So I, I think what we see is that certain terms such as um, democracy um, are contested, but what actually fills the concept is less important to political practice than the power and authority that the appellation of democracy brings. So in the relationship between democracy and conflict, this is the process where the issues pertaining to the existence and resilience of conflict come to be subsumed by the pursuit of democracy. 
and crucially, the pursuit of the normative objective of what is good and right, that is peace and democracy, deflects our attention from the sources of conflict, some of which may be highly legitimate. So the normative good of non-conflict becomes an end in itself, making it more difficult to engage with and address the actual issues which uh, contribute to the continuation of the conflict. Okay, I'm going to talk about some examples now. Um, and these mainly pertain to uh, Northern Ireland. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that in Northern Ireland and other deeply divided societies, conflicts are resilient uh, beyond uh, political peace agreements. I want to suggest that conflict is woven into the social fabric and takes on many manifestations. So one, one example of, of this kind of process is, is the fact that um, even when we reach political agreements, we, you know, we don't close off debate about issues about the past uh, and the things that have taken place. And in many respects, um, that, that's carried out in an official kind of way in which we're constantly kind of rewriting the history of the same war by revisiting events finding out new things uh, about them, uh, and in so doing, reliving the events that took place constantly. Uh, and I think the most recent example of that kind of process uh, was the Savile Inquiry into Bloody Sunday uh, and uh, the eventual verdict uh, and apology from the uh, British government to uh, the families of the victims of the British paratroopers in 1972. Um, but I think there are also a range of other ways in which um, the conflict continues and, and can't be ignored. Obviously, there are symbolic representations of conflict uh, in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, which are evident in, as you'll know, the widespread use of murals, uh, flags, painting of curbstones, and so forth to... Um, both territorially symbolize ownership of a particular piece of land, but also to capture and remember um, key events that have taken place. So the picture on your left is um, in the uh, bog side in, in Derry, and there's a whole range of these uh, as you go into the uh, bog side. Indeed, the graffiti artists have become known as the, uh, the bog side artists. Um, if you go straight across uh, the, uh, the bridge uh, that, that crosses the River Foyle and Derry, uh, you'll come into the Fountain uh, District, a, a, a loyalist district, uh, where, of course, you'll see uh, things like you see on the right there, where um, murals um, quite often sort of explain, well, we're in a process of peace at the moment, but the, the conflict isn't over. Uh, and we haven't forgotten what happened. There's also been a more recent phenomenon, a worrying phenomenon in many respects, of uh, what's called Troubles Tourism, uh, which is, of course, if you, if you go on to you know, TripAdvisor or something like that, they'll, they'll tell you that the, the, you know, the must-do thing in Northern Ireland, if you visit Belfast in particular, is to either get in a, a black taxi or an open-top bus and you know, tour around the place and have a look at where lots of terrible things happened, uh, to go and uh, look at the, the peace lines and the murals and so forth. Why on earth anyone would want to get in an open-top bus in Belfast is beyond me, because usually the weather does look something uh, like that up there, but I think people huddle together in, in, in the lower floor of the buses. Uh, but Troubles Tourism is a, a way of reliving uh, and rewriting uh, the conflict. Obviously, um, People who live beside peace lines and interface areas are um, perfectly aware of the continuation of the conflict in, in the areas uh, in which they live. But not only that, they have to put up with busloads of tourists coming along to the peace lines to write things like uh, you see on the right-hand side. So, you know, thanks to Wendy from Wyoming and, and her ilk for their... Uh, very sophisticated thoughts on, uh, on the conflict in Northern Ireland. Lest you think that this is um, an American affectation, try some of the Australian ones, um, which uh, are 
uh, equally vacuous and, and, um, and uh, re really not uh, very good understandings of, uh, of the conflict. And just to round it off, we've got Jürgen from Germany as well, who seems to think that the Northern Irish conflict is all about religion, and it is not. Um, but this is, uh, this is the way in which uh, the, uh, the conflict lives on in the experience, the everyday experience of people in, in Northern Ireland. And then, of course, there's the much more explicit expressions of the conflict, the fact that sectarian violence uh, hasn't gone away. Uh, and, of course, many of the, um, the murals and so forth are, are not remotely benign uh, in, in their interpretation. Uh, so this is a, a loyalist mural in, in North Belfast. Again, articulating that, okay, we might have peace at the moment, but you know, don't, don't assume that uh, we've forgotten and don't assume that we haven't the capacity to start up all over again. Uh, now, obviously, these are examples from a, a strange place, um, but I would argue that um, from uh, Cronulla to Tottenham and North London, we see multi-layered undercurrents of conflict uh, found in most societies. These are often not evident, or at least violently expressed, but we shouldn't take that to mean that conflicts uh, do not exist. And yet, we pathologize conflict in the construction of peaceful democratic relations as the prevailing norm to which conflict is the counterpoint. So, getting to the point of all of this, um, what do I mean in more detail by enduring conflict? Well, when I talk about enduring conflict, uh, I'm talking about it in two specific ways. One is the enduring nature of political conflict, which um, I've uh, spent most of my time alluding to so far. But secondly, I think that um, we also need to pay attention to the quality of endurance, the fact that people uh, living, particularly in, in divided societies, but also in less divided societies, uh, need to find ways of managing uh, and enduring the conflict uh, that is around them. So there's two different senses in which um, I'm talking about enduring conflict. Um, both of them, I think, allude to the limitations of uh, politics uh, as a way of overcoming conflict. Uh, and at best, I would say, politics is a mode of uh, potentially transforming conflict, but most of the time it's actually just managing conflict. So let me take the first of them, um, the enduring nature of political conflict, um, first of all. Well, what I'm suggesting is that conflicts are resilient despite political processes of resolution uh, and reconciliation. Conflict gets expressed in many ways from cultural practices through to the actual operation of political institutions. So if you look at the political institutions formed through the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, you'll see that they are actually based upon and reiterate the conflict. You have to designate yourself as either... Um, unionist, nationalist, or other, so that they can actually measure whether there is sufficient cross-community support uh, for any particular initiative. So the very conflict that the institutions designed to overcome uh, is deeply written into the institutions themselves. Uh, and I think there's a real practical resilience to uh, conflictual inscriptions that are so deeply socially and culturally ingrained that there really are very serious limitations to what politics can do. Even when there are peace agreements, the conflicts to which they pertain endure, and peace institutions frequently um, refer to uh, and, and reproduce the divisions which they're supposed to transcend. Uh, or, as Foucault would say, we're always rewriting the history of the same war, even when we are writing the history of peace and its institutions. So institutions created to grapple with conflict inevitably reinscribe that conflict in their formation. And these reinscriptions 
involve a particular narration or writing uh, of historical events. So institutions or practices uh, developed to address conflict scenarios cannot but help reinscribe them and our interpretations of conflicts may not be reflected in the institutions as they are formed. So if we're going to form institutions, they, they are based upon a particular telling of the story uh, which may not correlate uh, with our own. <coughs> so in dealing with these ins political institutions, I think we must potentially engage with institutions that involve a rating of conflicts with which we disagree and which we deeply oppose. This inevitably contributes to the endurance uh, of conflicts because there's such a remote possibility of uh, people agreeing in any kind of universal sense on the precise nature of political problems. Uh, the, let me turn to the second sense in which I mean that conflict endures. Uh, and this refers to uh, endurance as a feature of people in contemporary complex societies. I think in perpetuating the myth of non-conflict, we underestimate the everyday negotiation of conflict that people must undertake. In somewhere like Northern Ireland, obviously conflict uh, permeates everyday life to the extent that conditions after the peace process still very clearly reflect the troubles. Indeed, if you go into many of these interface areas uh, in Belfast, they'll tell you that things are worse since the peace agreement, that, that nothing's got better, that the peace dividend is experienced differentially across society. Uh, and those most deprived communities and in interface areas um, are, are the ones that certainly perceive themselves to have benefited the least, and they were the ones that suffered the most from the troubles anyway. So I think conflict continues to permeate uh, everyday life. Uh, and you know, the fact of the increase in the number and size of peace lines uh, is, is evidence of this. This demonstrates the forbearance that is required of populations in divided societies. But it also indicates how unevenly uh, the dividends are spread within them. So conflict not only endures in supposedly peaceful societies, Endurance is also a quality that is demanded of the people living in them. And in divided societies, debates around trauma, victimhood, and reconciliation are instructive uh, regarding the ways in which the, the endurance of conflict demands the quality of endurance uh, from people. So why does uh, conflict endure in this way? Well, obviously I'm suggesting that um, it's ingrained in social and cultural practices that make a real difference to people's everyday lives. But in theoretical terms, uh, I want to suggest that conflict endures in this way, usually because there are multiple narratives of the reasons for conflict and interpretations of conflict, and often these accounts are incommensurable uh, with one another. In somewhere like Northern Ireland, but in other conflicts, the zero-sum game precludes the acceptance of alternative truth in the sense that in order to accept your truth, I need to give up key aspects of my own self-understanding and understanding of uh, what has taken place. And this uh, incommensurability, the zero-sum game mentality, informs the drawing of lines between perpetrators uh, and victims. Uh, and I think as, as uh, many people currently doing research in Northern Ireland would tell you, there's very, very little agreement um, as to who the legitimate victims of the conflict are. And certainly I've talked to the several political actors who, who openly talk about a hierarchy of victimhood where our victims are more important than theirs. Quite often in Northern Ireland, many of the perpetrators of acts of violence were themselves victims. So it's a complicated picture. But this informs perceptions of uh, whose truths are more worth telling. So what I'm suggesting is that we need to grasp how the conflicts of the past 
forge our understandings and paradigms of truth uh, and the structures we use to try and manage them. Put simply, specific versions or explanations of the conflict give rise to very specific uh, possibilities of resolution. So no matter how much we wish to evade alternative readings of events, their narratives constantly confront us. I think the conflicts of the past have given rise to the institutional structure and configurations which we encounter. So they inscribe past conflict. Thus, conflict endures confounding uh, political attempts at resolution. So, I believe I've timed this quite right. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't practice my timing, but it looks like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be writing the money here. Um, let me move to a conclusion. Uh, and in order to do that, I'll return to um, the novels of Julian Barnes. I don't, I don't think Barnes has ever been used in relation to Northern Ireland before, but um, uh, I think his work's instructive. Uh, in one of his earlier novels, um, Nothing to be Frightened of, uh, Barnes also talks about um, how we remember and how we construct narratives. And to quote from that book, Barnes says, we talk about our memories, but we should perhaps talk more about our forgettings, even if that is a more difficult or logically impossible feat. Now, I want to suggest that while it seems logically impossible to remember our forgettings, it is in fact perfectly practical. I think the institutional structures in which politics takes place and the paradigmatic inscriptions through which debates are framed encapsulate the conflicts from which they emerge. As such, the possibility of actually forgetting one's forgettings is in some ways the logical impossibility. The process of forgetting, in political terms, is a kind of filtering mechanism through which we forge our narratives into meaningfulness by sidelining and denying that which unsettles uh, the logic of our narrative. But at the same time, alternative logics and truths are all around us. Um, for the weak and the defeated, or for the minorities and divided societies, quite often it's in the formation of institutions and ways of writing history that reflect the dominant paradigm that confronts those groups all the time and therefore animates the need uh, to challenge those particular readings of history. For the strong, the successful, the majorities, um, it lies in the persistent attempts of the weak to rewrite the dominant historical narratives upon which uh, social power is established and reproduced. So I think in this environment, uh, characterized by the endurance of conflict in both of the senses that I've discussed tonight, it is the forgetting of our forgettings which seems the logical impossibility. So, to conclude, um, what I would say that it is only through the imposition uh, of the signature of a normalized state of peace and democracy that we avoid confronting the reality of conflict. And yet, conflict endures and eats away at the fabrication of peace and democracy symbolized by the signature. Thank you.